Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In the previous videos, we've been looking at the sample EMG studies, and we've been trying to figure out what type of nerve injury there is. Is it a demyelination injury? Is it axonal injury? So now we're going to switch gears and now figure out where the nerve injury is. And to do that, we're really going to restrict our view to just these three columns right here. The column with the muscles, and especially the nerve and the root levels that correspond to that nerve. Now this kind of question can be intimidating, so in order to simplify it, we'll come down here and use this flow chart, and this will kind of guide how we approach the problem. The first question we'll ask ourselves is, is there nerve root involvement? And by nerve root, I mean compression or damage to the nerve roots. So you talk about a C5 radiculopathy, a C6 radiculopathy, and so on and so forth. Now, in order to be a true radiculopathy and have radicular symptoms, all the muscles with that common nerve root would have to be affected negatively. Okay, so let's take C5 nerve root, for example. Okay. So the axillary nerve, deltoid, this has C5 and C6. It's adversely affected. Uh, the supraspinatus, innervated by the suprascapular nerve, also has C5, adversely affected. We don't care how they're adversely affected for this. Okay. But you can see that the first four muscles here are all adversely affected and they all have C5 contributions. However, when you come down here, there's another muscle, brachioradialis, that also has significant C5 contributions, but it's not adversely affected. Okay, you can also see serratus anterior here, also not adversely affected. Okay, the fact that you have some muscles with that same nerve root that are not affected rules down that it is a radiculopathy and that the damage is at the nerve root level. Okay? We could make the same argument with the C6 nerve root. Okay? Again, these first four muscles are all adversely affected and they all have C6 as a contributor, but again, pronator teres also has C6, it's not affected. Brachioradialis also has C6, it's not affected, and you can make this argument all the way down. So most likely in this case, it's not radicular. Now before we completely rule out radiculopathy as the cause here, we need to do one more thing, and that's to check the nerves that originate off of the nerve roots directly. Okay, and I'll show you this on the brachial plexus, but understand that you don't necessarily need to draw that every single time for this. You just need to be aware of the nerves that come directly off of the nerve roots. And those are the long thoracic nerve if it's up there, which it actually is, the dorsal scapular nerve, which is not on here, and then any rami, and these are usually associated with the paraspinal muscles in the deep back. Okay, So here's the brachial plexus, and look here, this is the dorsal scapular nerve. Notice that this nerve innervates the rhomboids, major and minor, and the levator scapulae, and that it comes directly off of the C5 nerve root of the brachial plexus. If there was a C5 radiculopathy, this nerve would be affected, okay, because it comes directly off of that nerve root. This one coming down here is the long thoracic nerve. The only muscle that this innervates is serratus anterior. Now this has multiple nerve root levels, but notice the C5 contribution, the C6 contribution, and the C7 contribution, they come directly off of the nerve roots in the brachial plexus. In other words, if there was a C5 radiculopathy, it would affect the long thoracic nerve. If there was a C6 radiculopathy, it would also affect the long thoracic nerve because those contributions come directly off of those nerve roots. So here's a cross section of the spinal cord and the spine. Here's the spinal cord in the center. We can see here the dorsal root coming off with the dorsal root ganglion. Here's the anterior or ventral root. Those two fuse together, we get the spinal nerve, and then immediately the spinal nerve bifurcates into the ventral ramus, and the ventral ramus is really technically the roots of the brachial plexus, and so these actually will potentially form the brachial plexus if it's in the cervical or lumbar regions. And then we also get the dorsal ramus, which immediately goes back posteriorly, and it innervates the various deep muscles of the back, like the multifidus and the erector spiny. And so the point is, if we had a compression of the nerve root right here, so a radiculopathy, the dorsal ramus is so close to that that we would definitely see issues with that dorsal ramus, okay, or the dorsal rami. So that's why we check these. 
Now, in this analysis, we did have the long thoracic nerve that was tested. The dorsal scapular nerve was not tested, but the rami were tested. Now, with the long thoracic nerve right here, it's normal. That strongly rules down a radiculopathy. And also the rami in total were also normal. That also strongly rules down a radiculopathy. If these rami and long thoracic nerve and even dorsal scapular nerve were abnormal, that would strongly rule up a radiculopathy. So given that these are normal, I have now ruled out a radiculopathy. And given the information that we figured out before, I'm thinking that this is peripheral nerve or something distal to the nerve roots of the brachial plexus. It's also useful to think about, is it lower extremity or upper extremity? This is obviously upper extremity. Once we know that, we can ask, does the damage appear to be proximal to the elbow or distal to the elbow? Now, the reason this is important is because once we get to a point beyond the elbow, the brachial plexus has already divided into its terminal branches. There really is no brachial plexus anymore. It's really just beyond the elbow, median nerve, radial nerve, ulnar nerve, and then other smaller branches of those, like the interosseous nerves. Okay, We're really not considering the brachial plexus beyond the elbow. So if the damage appeared to be distal to that, uh, then we're really just going to get out a picture or draw a picture of the upper extremity beyond the elbow, looking at the order of innervation uh, for those nerves that appear to be affected. Okay, uh, We'll do an example with this in the next video. But here, the damage appears to be more proximal. So if we look at where the damage occurs, we're looking at the deltoid way up by the shoulder. Uh, we've got rotator cuff muscles way up by the shoulder. Biceps is really the most distal muscle affected. We're talking proximal to the elbow. And so it makes it more likely here that it's actually an issue somewhere in the brachial plexus. And so we need to either get out or draw a picture of the brachial plexus. I'll go to that slide in just a second, but let's take a look here. What nerves appear to be affected here? Axillary, suprascapular for both the rotator cuff muscles there, and the musculocutaneous nerve. Okay, let's remember that. So here's a good picture of the brachial plexus. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a note which nerves were affected. Okay, that's the first thing. So axillary nerve going to the deltoid, that was affected. So I'm going to put that red X right over the axillary nerve. I also remember that the suprascapular nerve was also negatively affected, right? That went to the supraspinatus muscle and the infraspinatus muscle. And then also remember the musculocutaneous nerve was also affected. Now the next thing I need to ask myself is what region of the brachial plexus or nerve or whatever piece of it do all three of these have in common? Okay, so just to give you an example, do they have the middle trunk in common? Well, no, right? There is a piece of the middle trunk that goes to the musculocutaneous nerve. There is a piece of the middle trunk that goes to the axillary nerve. But there is no piece of the middle trunk that goes to the suprascapular nerve because the suprascapular nerve comes directly off of the superior trunk. It can't have anything to do with the middle trunk. So we obviously know the middle trunk is not implicated here. Could it be in the anterior division of the middle trunk? Well, no, because not only does the suprascapular nerve not have any contribution from this anterior division, but actually neither does the axillary nerve, right? Because the anterior division comes off the middle trunk, and then only the musculocutaneous nerve receives any uh, piece of this anterior division. Now the question is, where is the most likely site of the damage? And that's really over here at the superior trunk. The superior trunk is the only spot on here that has all three of these red X's as a commonality. So if we think about the superior trunk, it directly gives off uh, the suprascapular nerve right there. It continues on into the lateral cord, which then um, becomes the musculocutaneous nerve, so that's affected. And then if we think about this posterior division of the superior trunk, it continues on into the posterior cord, which then gives off the axillary nerve. And so when we're kind of thinking about our answer to see if it makes sense, there's really only two things that we're thinking about. Number one, we want to make sure that this damaged site is proximal to all three of these. Okay? If we had the damaged site right there, that wouldn't make sense because this damaged site occurs distal to the suprascapular nerve, right? So yes, in this case, uh, this damage is proximal to all three of those. 
And then the other thing that we're concerned with is whether or not we can trace back these red X's to the damaged site. Can we trace them back? Yes, we can trace the suprascapular nerve back, we can trace the musculocutaneous nerve back, and we can trace the axillary nerve back by using this posterior division of the superior trunk. So if you're led to think that the issue is somewhere in the brachial plexus, that's how you go about analyzing it. Draw it out, have a picture, make some marks like this, and then deduce where that lesion or injury has to be. So hopefully this video gave you some good understanding about how to interpret an EMG when you think it's a brachial plexus problem. In the next video, we'll do one where this damage appears to be distal to the elbow, and we won't specifically use the brachial plexus. We'll actually do what's called order of innervation. So make sure to join us then. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel.